On behalf of the Ridgecrest Presbyterian Church, I want to welcome you to worship on this Sunday morning as we are gathered here in the sanctuary and as we worship in other places. We pray that the Spirit of God would touch your heart and lives, that you would grow deeper in your faith and knowledge and love of the Lord. And as we begin to worship, we uh, begin with the prelude. So hope that you uh, enjoy and the music and have an opportunity to settle your spirit as you are. glad to have you worshiping with us today. Our call to worship this morning is taken from Psalm 89 verses 1 to 2 and then 15 through 18 and also Matthew 10 40 to 40. Right now um, I'm going to start. I will be the L. You guys will be the P. If you're willing, stand up and join us. I will sing of your steadfast love, O Lord, forever. With my mouth, I will proclaim your faithfulness to all generations. I declare that your steadfast love is established forever. Your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. Happy are the people who know the festal shout, who walk, O Lord, in the light of your countenance. They exult in your name all day long and extol your righteousness. For you are the glory of their strength. By your favor, our horn is exalted, for our shield belongs to the Lord, our King to the Holy One of Israel. Jesus said, whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And, and whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. Please join us in singing the hymn, He's Got the Whole World in His Hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. 
his hands he's got the whole world in his hands he's got the whole world in his hands he's got the wind and the rain in singing, In My Heart There Rings a Melody. time of sharing joys and concerns, I want you to share uh, with the congregation that, may, that we may be in prayer together. Are there joys and concerns that you would bring before God as we join in prayer? Yes, Donna. Two things. Our son Jim is coming Tuesday, so I would ask travel mercies for me and his family. And I have a, a good friend who lost a son unexpectedly this month. Her name is Sharon, and I just want to lift her in prayer. She's struggling very much right now. Yeah. Other joys or concerns? Well, let's come together in prayer. Gracious God, we are thankful for the opportunity to gather, the opportunity to worship. We thank you that you are a God who is present. For as often as you may seem distant and beyond us and so transcendent that we perhaps wonder, can you be experienced? Are you real? Are you here? In so many ways and so often, you show yourself present. You show yourself in our relationships of care for one another. You show yourself present when you bring to our minds others who have needs. We thank you, God, that things that matter to us, 
matter to you. And in your own way, what matters to you, you make of importance for us as well. Thank you, God, that prayer is deep relationship with you. Thank you, God, that it is conversation and communication and communion. Thank you, God, for the richness, richness of life, for the myriad ways that you are present to us. Thank you, God, for your word. Thank you, God, for companions in the journey of faith. Thank you, God, for these who are gathered here today. Thank you, God, for opportunities to lift up those who are of concern to us. We pray that you would be with Jim and his family as they travel this week, this Tuesday, for the people they will meet along the way. We pray that you would give protection. Thank you, God, that you are present with Donna's friend, Sharon. We pray, God, for your spirit to move in gentle ways in her spirit and to touch her soul with healing balm that only you can give. Thank you, God, for her friendships and family who offer condolences, who share her sorrow. We pray, God, for Sharon. We ask, God, that you hear us as we pray for others. We pray for this country in the midst of uncertainty and turmoil and fear and anxiety. Oh God, would you draw your people to you? Be with Emma Brown, with Lottie Kennedy. Be with Sandy Alltop. Our daughter Sandy, who and her employees are able to return to work. Another one who has a negative process. Be with Tammy as she and others return to work safe from COVID 19 at this point. Protect them. Thank you, God, for moments of silence in our week when you whisper to us, when we hear you, when our thoughts turn towards you. Thank you for your love and compassion and mercy as each day you sustain us. And we thank you for the gift of faith that is ours through Jesus Christ, who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. There are two scriptures of it are going to be read this morning. One is uh, Psalm 1, and the other is uh, Romans 9, verses 1 through 5. Psalm 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, 
that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. I speak the truth in Christ, I am not lying. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race, the people of Israel. Theirs is the adoption to sonship. Theirs the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of the Messiah, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. The word of the Lord. Our hymn of preparation is How Firm a Foundation. It's sung to the tune of um, Away in a Manger. One hundred fifteen. scriptures that in our day and age may not be the kinds of scriptures that come readily to mind as the ones that give great delight and joy, at least on the surface. I'm thankful that Rex not only read the scripture today, which he did the Romans 9 verse, but out of the depths 
of his person, out of his dwelling with the scripture long in his life, came words I trust were memorized decades ago. Am I right? Perhaps as a young man, yeah. They're words that are not so different from some of the words that my type offer to couples who marry. Couples coming to marry, young people coming to marry, often are full of exuberance, a bubbly quality. They are often in the midst of this quality of being in love and excited about the wedding that is to take place and the whole ceremony and with families and a reception and the beginning of a life joined together. And it's wonderful. It is inspiring. Those of us who have been married a few years can receive something of a gift from that. Many times we older ones come to weddings in part for revitalization, rejuvenation, for remembering times long ago when we spoke words of love to another. And those words were not necessarily full of a lifelong of deep understanding. But those words often contained something of the youthfulness and even naivete of people who come to marry. I have uh, five benefits that I pulled from an article from Psychology Today, five hidden benefits to those in lifelong relationships or perhaps in marriage. So one benefit, you'll internalize your partner's positive judgments of you. And I want to expand this beyond just marriage relationship because it is true of the deepest of human relationships, the ones that are built on a deep trust. When someone communicates to you and you realize they mean it, they're not words of flattery, they are words of love and care and appreciation. And when they declare what they appreciate about you, those words have the potential to come a bit more deeply into us and serve to build on a foundation we have of being people who are loved. Because those qualities of appreciation have the potential to resonate with parental love that has been given to us over a period of years. And they have the potential to resonate with divine love that declares you are my child. You are a child of the covenant. You are the one my son died for, to give life for. They have the potential, these words of positive judgment, to build us up. They can be extraordinary. Likewise, the second benefit, you can reap the benefits of health behavior concordance. Now, on one level, that resonates with you have two people going through life who, at least at some level, desire to live in a healthy way. And often, the strength of health commitment or practices vary from one partner to the other. And so it often is that one comes with an established habit of hygiene and regular visits to the dentist and the doctor and so forth, or healthy combinations of food groups that another perhaps doesn't have. And recognizing as the years progress that health practices have some long-term benefits, often the one partner helps the other. One friend 
helps another. In genuine care for another, we've had friends who have spoken words that we've taken to heart. There are some ways to healthier, happier living that I've discovered. From time to time, I've shared with people something I experienced. I stopped drinking coffee because I had a cold, and my wife said it would be better with my cold if I would switch to tea, and I did so. While I discovered that the pains that I had from raising my arms over my head disappeared. And I thought, well, not only did my wife give me wisdom for drinking tea for health benefits with a cold, but it solved a problem that I was thinking might eventually re might require medication and perhaps surgery. So there's some health behavior concordance. A third benefit, you'll feel a sense of attachment security. There is this quality, and we have it happen from time to time, when we go out into life and experience disconcerting happenings. Sometimes it's the embarrassment of having stood up in front of a group of people and having become tongue-tied. And thanks be to God for people in our lives who care for us deeply and love us, who know the capacity we may have to communicate and do well in circumstances, and nonetheless there are times we fail. And they're the ones who are going to be there when we come home feeling downcast, disappointed, discouraged, ashamed, and more, who don't declare, well, because of this, I'm done with you. They're the ones who are with us, who give us a sense that we will never be alone. They're human forms of God being present with us in the midst of all circumstances in life. Something of a pleasant benefit. You can savor shared memories. There is something about sharing stories with one another that have deep meaning. We share memories of so much. They come through photographs. But even better, they come through the way we have remembered these shared experiences and how we share parts of them. And part of what's wonderful about sharing these memories is that we often recall parts of the memories that may have been forgotten for a time or haven't been noticed until now. It happens and it's beautiful. And so often it happens when sharing those memories together with another who was present. I, for one, benefit from it because many of the details often escape me. And sometimes they escape my wife. And when we take turns in the sharing what we remember, often a much more holistic picture comes to mind and what's shared is richer. And a fifth benefit that was mentioned, you can correct each other's thinking biases. And there are many times when that particular function saves us from going out into the world and acting and speaking foolishly. Do you know how that sounds? And remember, I love you. Remember, I'm with you. Remember, I know all of the bad habits that you've demonstrated so far in our life together, so I haven't abandoned you for those, but let me share this perspective on a bias that I believe you have that's affecting other relationships or is affecting us. And can you trust my love for you long enough to hear me out and then to ponder it and to perhaps wrestle with it a bit? And then you can tell me I was off base or there was a misunderstanding or we might receive appreciation and thanks. Thanks. 
because I had a goal of being a better person and you helped me. Now, there was a caveat that was mentioned uh, in one of the behaviors. Let's see if I can find it. Yeah, it was in the benefits of health behavior concordance because you can imagine health behavior concordance. What do you want for a snack? Well, me, I'd like some high fat potato chips polished off with some Haagen Dazs or Ben and Jerry's or something else decadent. What do you think? Oh, I think that's a great idea. I love it too. Let's, let's do it. The effect is part of the reason why it's important to pick a conscientious mate. Ah, it matters the quality and character of the people we choose to be in relationship with. And to me, that makes all the difference in the world. So when Rex was sharing from memory, blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers or I believe you had scoundrels scornful. scornful yeah the company we keep matters so if our regular company are the wicked and sinners and mockers not that we're not supposed to have relationship with such people. But there is a progression in these three Hebrew parallels that go deeper and deeper and deeper. It's one thing to walk on the path with another person because eventually the paths may eventually diverge. Walking along a path with someone else does not necessarily spell doom. But the longer we walk on the path with others, with the wicked, the more and more and more inclined we may be to take on the thoughts and behaviors and the words, all of what it means to be the wicked. And it's one thing to walk in that path, but to stand in that place when we also recognize that it is the wicked that will not stand in the judgment, there's a connection with the two forms of standing. It is in part to say, when we stand to offer a pledge of allegiance, we stand together as people stating something that we hold in common together. We stand together for something. Well, in this case, standing with the sinners suggests that one is standing with the sinners in opposition to another standing that one might have had, standing with the righteous. It has to do with an identity. And in this day and age, standing with others has become a rather confused kind of things. If one engages in a protest today, one does not know for sure what others are protesting for sure that one stands with. There may well be the formal piece of the protest, but some of the nuances of differences we may hold may be actually stronger that what we would stand to be united in protest of. There may be some deep divisions of what's most important in our lives. We may well stand in protest of something and do so out of a deep and abiding, abiding faith in God. And we might find ourselves connected with people who scorn God and yet stand together in protest. There may be a part where we would find ourselves divided. Or sit in the company of the scornful or mockers. Perhaps has the connection with those gathered in the assembly 
and the sinners will not be in the assembly of the righteous. And it is the righteous who assemble to worship God. It is the righteous who assemble to affirm their relationship with God, the gifts of God, the word of God, the commandments of God, the life of God, the presence of God. The righteous sit in the, the assembly to worship who made everything and who has given to us every good gift. But the scornful and the mockers scorn and mock the gifts of God, the presence of God, the person of God. To sit in the seat of scornful or mockers or scoffers is to sit with others who are in opposition of God. In truth, this psalm is one of the most extreme of contrasts, pitting the righteous with a perspective of the wicked and sinners and scornful. The two don't go hand in hand, and the two do not enjoy company with God together. There is a distinction, and they are distinctions of not just a couple of choices that one may have made or may have not made. The person who stands in an assembly and makes a proclamation of faith in Jesus Christ, and that's the extent of the commitment that is made, well, it won't be very long before such a person doesn't lead a life resembling that of a follower of Jesus Christ. The psalm Rex read today is one that touches deeply on the practices of those who live in relationship with God. There is a reason for delighting in the law of the Lord, in the instruction of the Lord, in the word of the Lord, there is a reason for delighting in these if one is in relationship with God. For one, in meditating on these laws or on the law of God, the instruction of God, which is a gift from God, one has potential to grow deeper in relationship with the God who has given the law. In looking into the law, and treating it as a gift from God, one will discover some of the marvels and wonders of God. God did not give the law with an intent and purpose that we should be miserable. Truly, the law was given out of the heart of God for us to know what is the good and pleasant and righteous way to live. In coming to terms with the breadth and depth of the law of God, one has an opportunity to enter into the fellowship of God. For what is it like the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit living together? It is like those who treat one another in all ways with love. There is nothing of the prohibitions going on there. The love is genuine and the love is perfect. And it is the design of God that we should know ways that this love can be lived out in community. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, as the New Testament reads. Why? Well, in loving God, let's meditate on this. What does it require of us that we come to know God? And the person who has committed to knowing God has help in the process of knowing God to love God. And that is God himself. God is involved in the midst of the life of anyone who seeks to understand his commandments and to live by them. 
because it was God's desire that all human beings should be blessed. And the law, the Torah, the Ten Commandments, the commandments found throughout Scripture, the instruction that is given by the prophets to kings and people alike is all about coming to terms with a way of living in harmony with God. And the one who has committed himself or herself to such a life will never be disappointed if there is a never giving up. When I declare that I don't like a particular commandment, the commitment to meditate on the law day and night calls me to meditate on the commandment I don't like. Don't covet what your neighbor has. Well, what's wrong with that? I have something that is a new joy to me. And I guess I perhaps should have said last week that Father's Day is perhaps also well understood as Men of the Church Sunday, a day to celebrate something of what it is to be men. And the most significant woman in my life determined that since I hadn't had a watch for a long time, that she wanted me to have this as a gift. And my first impression when I saw it was it's, it's big and a bit heavy, and it was. But I thought, she chose this for me. And it was one of those kind of one size fits, fits many bands. Uh, this one did not fit me. Jewelers have tools that are designed for changing the links. I'm not a jeweler, and I didn't have the tool. And I went online and found a YouTube video on how to change and remove links and so forth. And so I watched the video, and I followed the video, and it said there are arrows on the inside of the band, and they are, and they tell you which way to poke the, um, what are they called? The axle. The axle, or yeah, anyway, so there's a, there's a piece inside, and if you, if you pull it through and you do that with another one, you can take out links uh, from the watch. Well, the suggestion was to put it on something soft and get like a, a nail and a hammer and tap it down. Well, a half hour or 40 minutes later, I had tapped down four of them, and one of them got destroyed in the process, and I was able to tap back the two that were needed and I came up with a watch, and I've come to like the watch. Doesn't keep uh, time quite as perfectly as, uh, say, my cell phone. Um, it gains maybe a second every couple of days, but it keeps pretty good time. But I think it's quite handsome. The last thing in the world I want you to do is to start envying my watch. And the last thing in the world I want to do is to start looking at Rex Randolph's Rolex and saying, you know, this, this Invicta watch is nice. But you know what I really like? God said, Ralph, do not covet. Why did God command us not to covet? And that's the only one of the commandments I'm going to touch on. You can go home and meditate on others. But one thing I appreciate about being commanded not to covet. At one point, it moves me more and more and more to consider what is it that I have. If you'd been present in the Korean congregation's worship service this morning, you'd have had an opportunity to sing about it. Ever sing, count your blessings? Well, how many blessings has the Lord given me? If I'm coveting, there's a good chance that I'm not focusing very well 
on the blessings that God has given me, on his gifts. In fact, I might even be tempted to say, you know, I really don't like being Christian. There's parts of this Christianity that I don't like. I don't like that I'm supposed to meditate on the law of God. Aren't there some easier ways? And if you go out shopping in world religions and Christian religions, you can find some that will even declare, oh, the law of the Lord. Don't worry about the law of the Lord. Jesus loves you and he saved you. And what? He's solved your problem for you. So you don't need to be concerned with the law anymore. Well, good Lord, that's a dangerous kind of a thing, really. Because not only do we find in the law of the Lord commandments against actions we might be inclined to take, we also discover in the law of the Lord protections. And for those who truly and deeply meditate on the law of the Lord, discover great, great wisdom for living well. But again, to return to the place of this, so you want to reap the benefits of health behavior concordance. And you might say we want to reap the benefits of spiritual health concordance. It matters deeply, the conscientiousness of the person who's involved, and that includes us. To be careless with the law of the Lord ultimately makes it very difficult, if not impossible, to grow in our faith, to grow in sanctification, to become more and more and more Christ-like. And one thing I'm sure of, if I'm committed to building deep abiding relationship with others and I don't abide by the riches that are available to be discovered in the law of the Lord, in the instruction of the Lord, my relationships will be poorer. My presence in a relationship will be poorer. This psalm is a rich psalm, and it describes some marvelous benefits. Oh, the one who is blessed, and take the time this afternoon perhaps to read a New Testament reading on blessedness. You can find it in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 5, the Beatitudes that, that begin, blessed, blessed, blessed. The person who meditates on the law of the Lord night and day, that person is like a tree planted by streams of water. Let's face it, irrigation was very different in the day of Israel than it is today. Today you might say, so what? You don't have a stream of water. But out here in the desert, if there isn't a stream near the tree, there better be drip irrigation or something like it. Or that tree, if it's one that produces leaves and fruit, is not going to make it. But a tree that is planted by a source of one of its greatest necessities, water, has the potential to be the healthiest of trees. I don't think it's accidental that the woman at the well heard from Jesus, well, if you knew who I was, who's speaking to you, you would have asked me for water, and I would have given you living water. The tree planted like a stream is like a person planted in the Lord who receives living water that nourishes us. And it comes, I believe, when we truly and deeply value, appreciate the word of God, the instruction of God. And what happens for that tree planted by streams of water yields its fruit in season. 
And a Christian planted by a stream of living water produces fruit. One's offspring are fruitful offspring, for they have received knowledge and instruction of the Lord from a mother and father who has discerned within the law of the Lord gifts to give a child, gifts of instruction for a life well lived. And furthermore, fruit of the Spirit in other relationships in life, in the midst of terror and conflict and anxiety, isn't it the people of God who have dwelled deeply with the Spirit of God and know the Word of God, who stand firm in a marvelous way? For it is these who stand in the congregation in the judgment when the firmness of the foundation is revealed. To stand before God for judgment, does one have a solid grounding in truth? Is one grounded in the gospel, in the word, in relationship with Jesus Christ? Is one indeed well-developed and firmly planted? Or is one like chaff and a little breeze comes along and it starts moving away and it's blown away and what? It's not good for much anything else but to be put in the fire and burned. And the leaf does not wither and whatever they do prospers. The beautiful thing about the Psalms is that maybe the psalmist is not saying, oh, and bad things are not going to happen to you. But even in the midst of whatever tragedies and horrors come in life, there's a great difference between those who are planted and rooted in a faith and in the knowledge of God than those who don't have rooting, than those who don't have the relationship with God. I love what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said before going to the fire. It seems they did not have an absolute assurance that it was going to be nothing for them to go in the fire. Because they were open to the possibility that if indeed they did not bow down and worship a statue, if they stood firm in their faith and resolve that they were going to worship God and no one else and have no other gods before him, they were perfectly prepared to be burned up in the fire. If that's the way it's going to be, so be it. Even as they declared their God could save them. And they weren't about to turn away from their God. And as we know the story, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in the fire. And what? Was it just the three of them? How many were seen by the others in the fire? How many? Four. The silent voices have spoken out with fingers. Four. There were four in the furnace. And you go home and think about it. You meditate. Who's the fourth? And what does it mean? But the three went in alone into a fire that killed off the guards who threw them into the fire. An incredibly hot furnace. And yet there were four. And when they came out, miracle of miracles, not even a smell of smoke on their clothing. God was present. Last word. There were questions among the early Christians. Is there any benefit at all to being Jewish. And Paul did not throw his siblings in the faith, who are not Christians, he did not throw them under the bus to say, yeah, the whole life of Jewish faith was rot and a mistake. What did he say in chapter 3 of Romans that the Jews, is there an, an advantage? You bet. The oracles of God were given to them. What does that mean? Well, the oracles of God are different from the oracles of temple gods that are no gods. 
The word of the Lord was given to the Jews. And what else? Well, that's what Rex read that was expounded in Romans chapter 5. And these, Paul says, and I believe with all that is in me that Christ affirms that adoption is sonship. Divine glory belonging to them, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the gift, and temple worship and promises. And those who had gone before who were faithful, the patriarchs, from them is traced the human ancestry even of the Messiah. Was there something significant that God did in, with, through, and for the Jews? And Paul gives a resounding yes. And we who are Christian have a responsibility to delve deeply into the word of God and the law of God. And in the process to discover a richness, perhaps, if we've not done it yet to be discovered, there are gifts to be received. So I offer this to us as a word from God and the rewards. How did the psalm conclude? For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, as if to say the, right, the way of the righteous will endure in this life and forever. But the way of the wicked leads to destruction. Those of us who know God and love God have opportunities to not walk in the way of sinners and the wicked and sit in the seat with the scornful, but we do have opportunities to reach out with the word of God and the gospel and the love of God to others as well. Gracious God, we thank you for your word that is life-giving. We thank you for the law that shapes our lives in a powerful and wondrous way. We thank you, God, for what we experience in pondering the words of the law and the ways of our lives in your life. We ask, God, that we might find the greatest joy in growing deep in you as righteous people. Blessed are the righteous, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our song of response is, Rise Up, O Church of God. and offerings. So as Bob offers the offertory, I invite you to bring your offerings. And if you would choose to, if you're watching online, uh, you can mail in uh, donations, contributions to the Ridgecrest Presbyterian Church, PO Box 566, Ridgecrest, California, 93556.
invite us to join in the prayer of dedication that is printed in the bulletin. Let us pray. O God, light of the minds that know you, life of the souls that love you, strength of the thoughts that seek you, help us so to know you that we may truly love you, so to love you that we may fully serve you, whose service is perfect freedom, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our song of sending is step by step. And could we sing that uh, chorus part twice, Bob? Um, I will seek you in the morning and I will learn to walk in your ways. Yes. Okay. Go forth into the world with peace and hope, for the God who gave you and me life loves us with all that he is. And in looking into the word of God, we discover how deeply he loves us. So go in peace to love and serve and enjoy.